Hello, my brothers and sisters. God bless you. Welcome to another episode of the Foundation Study of the Biblical Sanctuary. I pray that the Lord has blessed your day, and I thank you for joining us in this very important Bible study. As we are, we are studying the sanctuary and what it means to us today, what it meant in the times of Israel, what it meant for Jesus and how it reflected him, and how it imparts to us today. In our last episode, we talked about the tools that the Lord used in beginning to build the sanctuary. We learned, my brothers and sisters, that before God can work with us, we have to be willing to give ourselves to him. And we also learned that the Lord desires to dwell in us because the Lord has to work in us to fulfill his plan of salvation. We also learned, my brothers and sisters, that in order for God to work with us, we have to work with him and do things his way. And that's very important for us, my brothers and sisters, because in following God's plans, you can never go wrong. God does not make mistakes. And when God asks us to do something or not do something, you can rest assured that is the best thing for our lives. And even more importantly, my brothers and sisters, we learn just how God is able to do these things in us with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very important to us, my brothers and sisters, and we're going to find in other illustrations when we go into the holy place, when we begin to talk about sanctification, just how important and just what important role the Holy Spirit plays in us as we go through on the plan of salvation. Well, like I spoke last uh, episode, we're going to move in now to the furnishings that we find in the sanctuary. It's really important, my brothers and sisters, that we understand what each one of these and are and how they play a role in our salvation. Because God is a God of order, and everything that he does, he does in an orderly way. God doesn't skip uh, places. God does not skip steps. He always makes it a point, my brothers and sisters, that for us to walk in a right path in the correct way. God doesn't want us to miss out on anything. And he illustrates this throughout the process of the sanctuary. Just to go over a little, we studied that there are three processes that we have to go through in the plan of salvation. There's number one, the justification. And in justification, we learned that that Part of the sanctuary is when we talk about the altar and the labor of water. We're going to be talking about the altar today. But when you go into sanctification, we go into the holy place. And there we, there's the candlestick, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. And then we go into the most holy place where you find the Ark of the Covenant. Each one of them is an important step in our salvation. Each one of them help us through our justification, through our sanctification, and finally getting into the glorification of God, which is the blessed hope when we see Jesus come back in all his glory and we can finally be with him for all eternity. Well, like I said today, what we're going to study is the altar. Now, this is going to be a two-part. Every one of the furnishings, my brothers and sisters, has so much illustration that it's impossible to try to fit it all in a half hour program. It really is, my brothers and sisters. Reality of it is, is that we can spend 15 eternities and we still will not get everything that the sanctuary is. That's how complex, that's how deep God is. But amen to God that he has given us the opportunity to be able to at least understand in our human minds just what the plan of salvation is. Now, the beginning is how this is entitled because as you see, when you walk into the sanctuary, the very first item that you see there is the altar of sacrifice. And we need to understand this, my brothers and sisters, that this is not the end. Many people look as, at what Jesus did on the cross as the end of salvation. But when you study the sanctuary, it's actually the beginning. And there are a lot more steps that need to be taken. Now, what Jesus did for us on the cross is very important. And we're going to illustrate exactly how the altar reflected Jesus. In John 1.29, when John was trying to explain who Jesus was to the disciples and to everyone who was around him, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when he saw Jesus, he yelled out in a strong voice, behold, the Lamb of God, reflecting very clearly, man, that the great sacrifice that the sanctuary reveals is Jesus himself. Remember, I told you, my brothers and sisters, that the central theme, the central figure of the sanctuary is Jesus. 
you cannot be saved without Jesus. And we're going to see, my brothers and sisters, just how this altar reflected and how it revealed the sacrifice that was needed on our behalf. The altar of sacrifice. In Exodus 27, verses 1 to 8, you find a description of this altar of sacrifice. We're going to see, my brothers and sisters, that every piece of furnishing had a description and God wanted it built in a very specific way. And even the way he builds it, the materials that you find in each piece has a reflection to Jesus. And we're going to see how this fit with Jesus, the altar of sacrifice. Now, to give you a little background of what the altar of sacrifice was, the altar was seven and a half by feet by seven and a half feet. It was also hollow on the inside, and there's an important reason why. And the altar and all its utensils were made of bronze. Now, this is important. These are very important illustrations and definitions as to how the altar looked. Seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet is a very big measurement. And the reason is, is because the sacrifices that were made on this altar were bulls or goats were sheep. They were very large animals. And it wasn't at times, my brothers and sisters, where only one sacrifice was made. And this was an altar that had to hold these sacrifices day and night because they were required to bring sacrifices in the morning and also at night. It was hollow on the inside so it could hold all these animals. It, was, it had a great crate and it had to hold all of the animals that were in there because a lot of these offerings were cut up into different pieces because each piece of the sacrifice had also a reflection. The altar and all of the utensils were made of bronze. And this is very significant also. The bronze, the material in which the furnishings are made, are very, very significant. As you go in Book of Revelation, and I'm going to read these verses to you, when John, the revelator, who both the book of Revelation saw images of Jesus in the sanctuary in heaven, this is how he described Jesus. He said his feet were like fine brass as it refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And then he says in Revelation 2.18, And to the angel of the church of Thyteria write, These things says Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet, were like fine brass. Now it's interesting, my brothers and sisters, man, that when Jesus, when John sees Jesus, he is shown to have the feet of bronze. Now what do feet signify in the scriptures? Well, if you go to Isaiah 52, 7, the Bible says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. No one brought the greatest news like Jesus because Jesus brought us the news of salvation, who proclaims peace. Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace, who brings glad tidings of good things. Every message that Jesus brought to us was life, was a plan of salvation, who proclaims salvation. Jesus was the ultimate salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Remember, Jesus came here to reveal to us the image of his father and to reveal to us the plan of salvation. So the, the fact that John was able to see Jesus with bronze feet reflected that Jesus was the salvation. See, God doesn't do anything. And I have found this in my personal studies with God, that God does nothing by accident. Everything has a purpose. Every word in the Bible has a purpose. Every color, every material, it has a purpose. And the altar was to resemble our salvation, who is Jesus Christ. So Jesus is described with having the bronze feet, just like the altar was. And it was described as him coming from a fear of fire, which is what Jesus did. He died on the cross for us. Very beautiful illustration of who Jesus is and an illustration for us to take us to Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. Now, we need to understand that the sacrifice when it was brought to this building of the sanctuary, the sacrifice was not something new. This wasn't something that it just came to the Lord and he began to do it with the nation of Israel. You go all the way back to the book of Genesis and you find that sacrifice began the moment sin did. 
We go all the way back to Genesis and we read sadly of the fall of Adam and Eve. Now God had illustrated very clearly to him, to them both, do not eat of this tree because the day that you eat of this tree, you will die. So as we know that Adam and Eve sadly sinned against God. But something interesting that Adam and Eve tried to do when they sinned against God. The Bible says that they made aprons out of fig leaves to try to cover them because they realized they were naked. The moment they sinned, they realized, wait a minute, we've never seen this before. The Bible says they were naked and they were not ashamed, but the moment they sinned, all of a sudden this nakedness came upon them and they decided, let me cover up. They, so they decided to take the leaves off the tree and just make themselves an apron. But Jesus came looking for them. And you know, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus had a nice talk with them as to why they, uh, they rebelled against God. But something that Jesus did very important in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible says that the Lord made coverings for Adam and Eve from skin, skin of animal. Reflecting, my brothers and sisters, the very first sacrifice that took place. And why did this sacrifice take place? Because we cannot cover ourselves in sin, my brothers and sisters. We cannot make ourselves righteous. The moment we sin, my brothers and sisters, we become unrighteous. And there's no way that we can cover ourselves and present ourselves to the Lord. In the sheep, in the, the skins that Jesus used to cover Adam and Eve, it was a reflection of letting them know that only Christ, our righteousness, can cover us. Because the Bible illustrates very clearly that all our righteousness is but filthy rags. But in Jesus, he illustrated that you have sinned, but yet you are not fully lost. Though you may die, in him you may live, because he is our righteousness. So the very first sacrifice revealed to us that we cannot find salvation in of ourselves, and we can never cover our own sins. It is only by the righteousness of Christ, by his death, by his sacrifice, that we could ever be redeemed righteous. And we'll see that in part two. In Genesis chapter four, the verses three to seven, you find another illustration of the sacrifice. And this is an illustration between two brothers, Cain and Abel. Now God made it clear what type of sacrifice he wanted. He wanted a lamb. He wanted to be sacrificed. It needed to be blood. Unfortunately, Cain decided to bring his talents, his own thing. He wanted to offer the Lord what he wanted. Now, the Bible clearly illustrates that Cain was an individual of tiller of the ground. So he planted, he had fruit. So when he did his sacrifice, he came to the Lord and presented to him the fruits of his labor, all the fruits from the ground, and this is what he presented. Abel followed the instructions of God, and he brought to the Lord his lamb exactly what the Lord wanted him to bring. The Bible says that God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain, signifying teaching us something very important, my brothers and sisters. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot bring any offering from anything that we can do to justify and to be saved. Our salvation is completely and utterly on Jesus. In Acts 4.12, it tells us very clearly that there is no other name in which we can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. So God illustrates this through this example of Cain and Abel that he offered the one sacrifice that was needed and we need to accept that sacrifice which is Jesus Christ. We can't offer God anything. We cannot save ourselves. It's an impossibility. There is no amount of anything that we have in this world to justify and to save us. Our salvation can be found only in Christ. And this is what the lamb that Abel offered reflected. And when Cain offered his own, he was trying to save himself by his own works. That never works, my brothers and sisters. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. Another illustration, and this is one of my favorites, it's in Genesis 22, 1 to 19. And this illustration, my brothers and sisters, is when Abraham, who waited 25 years to receive his son Isaac, all of a sudden hears a voice where God tells him, go sacrifice your son, your beloved son, the one you care so much about, go and sacrifice him. For three days, 
Abraham struggled with this command that God came, gave him until he finally found himself at Mount Moriah where he was to sacrifice Isaac. And he made his decision that if this is what God wanted, he would give it to him. But something beautiful happened. The moment that Abraham raised his hands to strike Isaac and kill him, he heard a voice from heaven saying, do not touch that son. And he said, and the voice told him, now I know you fear me because you would not withhold your own son from me. And in that, Abraham turns to the side and he sees a ram stuck in some bushes there. And he realizes very clearly, man, that he can release Isaac and use that ram to sacrifice to the Lord. And he named it, the Lord will provide. Signifying what? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. My brothers and sisters, the sacrifice is beautiful because this is the father who gave us. We deserve to die. We deserve to pay the penalty of death. But instead, the Lord provided the sacrifice that was needed in Jesus Christ. So as you can see, my brothers and sisters, the sacrifices were not something new to the nation of Israel. This was not something new to the Bible. This was going to be illustrated in a little more teaching. He was, he was going to uh, give some more explanation and reflect more upon Jesus. But it has always been from the beginning that our only plan of salvation from God is through Jesus. And this has been throughout the whole history of the Bible. From the beginning where Adam and Eve sinned all the way through to the father of the nation of Israel, which was Abraham. There, are three, there were three main forms of sacrifices that were offered. Now, the nation of Israel were required to do these offerings, and they were all different types of offerings, but they all reflected the same individual. And we're going to talk a little bit about how these main forms of sacrifices reflected Jesus. The first one was the burnt offering. Now, this was something, my brothers and sisters, that they were required to do in the morning and at night. And the burnt offering was the very first thing, man, that was done with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Abraham. It always had to do with them killing the sacrifice, but also then burning it as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, the burnt offerings reflected worship and dedication. Now, how does this reflect Jesus? Well, in Revelation 14, 7, part of the third angel's message, the first message is that we must all turn back to worship the creator. The creator signifies Jesus, for he it is by him and through him that all things exist. So when he's talking about the burnt offerings, it was to bring their vision towards the one individual they needed to worship, which was Jesus. So the burnt offerings were offered as worship. It wasn't just simply, my brothers and sisters, that they were sitting up there offering, you know, through sin. We'll talk about some of those, but it was also a reflection of them worshiping. This is why the Lord did not want them to worship other gods, because when they worship other gods and when they sacrifice to other gods, they were reflecting and they were thinking upon other gods. But the Lord said there is but one God and our salvation is based on Jesus. So when they brought an offering, it was their way of saying we will worship the one true God, the creator, him who offered himself for us. It was also a form of dedication. In Exodus 13, 12 and Numbers 3, 13, we read that the Lord required the nation of Israel to dedicate to them their firstborn. It didn't matter whether it came from an animal, it didn't matter if it came, if it was their physical son. Everything that was first was dedicated to the Lord. Now, this was a reflection of Jesus. When he was born, you read in Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 24, that after the, the required time, Mary brought Jesus to be dedicated to the Lord. Jesus is the only begotten son of the Father. He was to be dedicated to the Father, and He was to be our offering. 
beautiful illustration, man, to show very clearly that even Jesus himself, while he was on this earth, followed the very customs that he himself established through the sanctuary service, and he was dedicated. Dedicated to what? Dedicated to God and dedicated to us as our personal sacrifice. There was also the sin offering, and this was the most common because this was whenever they sinned, it was automatic in that they had to come to the Lord to seek um, forgiveness. Now, it also reflected reconciliation. Now, how does this bring us to the Lord? Well, in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5, and Numbers 5, 7, they were required to confess their sins. What they would do is they would bring a lamb or whatever animal they brought, and what they would do was to put their hands over this creature, and they were to confess the sins that they had committed. And basically what they were doing, my brothers and sisters, was transferring their sins, confessing them upon this animal that was to die on their behalf. We confess, he forgives. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is how it signified Jesus. In 2 Chronicles 7, 12 to 14, when um, the Lord reflects very clearly when Solomon was dedicating the temple to the Lord, he said, and these are the words that God was saying, that if my people at any time rebel against me, they turn away from me, but they come back to the temple seeking reconciliation, the Lord will come back to them and reconcile with them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, we are told that through, through Jesus, the Father was reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus is our reconciliation. He is the one who connects us with the Father in heaven. It is only through Jesus. Jesus himself said it. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is our reconciliation, our connection to the Father. It is through him and by him that we are able to talk and pray to the Lord. Because the Father hates sin. He loves us but he hates sin. And the only way that we can present ourselves before the Father is through the mediation of Jesus. And Jesus, through this sacrifice, became the reconciliation. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are not able to reconnect with the Father. Beautiful. Also the peace offerings. Now this was offerings to show gratitude, goodwill, fulfillment of balls. In Leviticus chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, the Lord says that if the people feel gratitude in their hearts and they desire to bring him a thanksgiving, they can choose whatever animal they wanted. And this was just for them to go to the Lord and say, you know what, Lord, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you that I don't have to die and you have chosen the sacrifice for me. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, that we should be thankful in all things, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ. Our gratitude goes through what Jesus did. Our gratitude goes through what the Father did on our behalf in giving us Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, when the angels wanted to tell the shepherds and everyone else who was listening that Jesus had been born, they said, good will and peace for all men on earth. They reflected as Jesus being the good will towards man from the Father. And in John 19, 30, the fulfillment of, of vows, Jesus finally says very clearly, it is finished, signifying what? The plan of salvation is there. The road for us to enter the kingdom of heaven has been finished because Jesus completed his work on the cross. That's why you hear Jesus, it is finished. That's how the peace offerings reflect Jesus. They all come back to Jesus. They were all to teach of the one redeemer that we need in our lives. In the book, Christ in His Sanctuary, page 32, paragraph 2, it says, In the sacrificial offerings on every altar was seen a Redeemer. With the cloud of incense arose from every contrite heart, the prayer that God would accept their offerings as showing faith in the coming Savior. Every offering reflected to Jesus the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 62, paragraph 2, the pen of inspiration writes, The sacrificial offerings were ordained by God to be to man a perpetual reminder and penitential acknowledgement of his sin and a confession of his faith in the promised Redeemer. 
they were to accept very clearly, just as we accept today, that we are sinners in need of a Redeemer, in need of a Savior, but we can't save ourselves and we can't pay for our sins. So our faith is completely and utterly on the sacrifice that Jesus did on our behalf. And this is what every sacrifice was to bring to the mind of everyone who participated in the sanctuary service, that Jesus was the Redeemer. It all reflected him. The great controversy says, by offering of blood, the sinner acknowledged the authority of the law, confessed his guilt and transgression, and expressed his desire for pardon through faith in a Redeemer to come. My brothers and sisters, the altar of sacrifice reflected what Jesus did on our behalf. And without that sacrifice, my brothers and sisters, this conversation would not be taking place. It is only because of what Jesus did on the cross that we have any hope. It is only because of what Jesus did on the cross, his willing sacrifice on our behalf, that we can even arise and, and, and live. Because without Jesus, if Jesus had not performed this sacrifice, this world would not have survived. We survive today because of what Jesus did, the ultimate sacrifice. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to study the next Next episode, we're going to study how this justifies us. Because remember that the, the altar and the water, the labor water, all reflect justification, the very first part of the process of salvation. How does what Jesus did on the cross justify me? And my brothers and sisters, we're going to learn something very interesting. And again, God does everything in order. We're going to see, my brothers and sisters, man, that the plan of salvation does not end at the altar. It didn't end at the altar. The whole sanctuary had to be used because we will learn very clearly, my brothers and sisters, that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was the final feast, the final act in the plan of salvation. What Jesus did on the cross, we will see, my brothers and sisters, was but the mere beginning to the plan of salvation. And another thing that we're going to find very, uh, that we're going to learn is that the altar and the water laven are the only two instruments in the sanctuary that you find on the earthly sanctuary. You don't find them in the heavenly sanctuary. It's very important, my brothers and sisters, and we're going to study this a little more as we go into details in future episodes. Because in order for Jesus to have died and fulfilled this sacrifice, he had to come to this earth because he had to die here, because there was no one that was going to kill him in heaven. And the water level representing his resurrection and the justification we find here. The rest of the plan of salvation, we find with what Jesus is doing for us in heaven. But it's very important, my brothers and sisters, that we understand that without this sacrifice, the plan of salvation could not have begun. It began with Jesus willingly sacrificing on our behalf. And it will end with Jesus willingly coming back to receive us as his people. My brothers and sisters, I pray, man, that as we study the sanctuary, we can reflect more and more on Jesus. He is the focus. Salvation is the focus of the sanctuary. It's not just about learning what each material was, what it was built. It's the focus of Jesus, the beginning the author and the finisher of our faith. And I pray, my brothers and sisters, as we continue to study, that we will be blessed to see the sacrifice of Jesus and what it should mean to us and how that began the plan of salvation for each one of us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus. Without that sacrifice, the Lord, life would be meaningless. Without that sacrifice, we would have no hope. But because you were willing to sacrifice Jesus on our behalf, we today can have joy, peace. We can have a hope. We can look forward to tomorrow and we can see the Lord that one day this same Jesus is going to return for us because he came the first time, he will come the second time. And because he willingly saved us the first time, he will save us the second time. We thank you, the Lord, for Jesus. And may Jesus live in our hearts and in our minds forever. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless my brothers and sisters.